Okay, so what we're going to talk about today is the statistical mechanics interpretation of entropy. So this will get us to our modern understanding of entropy, whereas if we were to describe entropy in the most basic of forms, we would say it is equal to fill in the blank. Entropy is if you had to describe it to your grandmother, you would use what term to describe entropy? Randomness. Right, but this has no relationship at all to our classical definition of entropy, right? Our classical definition of entropy is this absolutely beautiful equation, ds is equal to or greater than zero. Now that has no relationship to randomness whatsoever, right? That's just a strictly mathematical definition of entropy. So. What we're going to talk about is for simplified systems where we actually have particles, we can put them into positions, we can put them into energy states, how do we come up with this notion that entropy is equal to randomness? So what we showed was for the canonical partition function, oh and by the way, seminar on Monday, right up our alley, I hit on all the nice little topics that we were discussing. Different ensembles are better for different types of calculations, stat mech and Monte Carlo simulations, that was a... They did me a service on that one. That was a good seminar. I thought that the application, though, was a little bit uninspiring. Right, so you might have heard the question by, he's a chemistry professor, Michael Grunwald. Uh, he was asking why they, they drew a plot of, I think it was like, I don't know, like saturation versus steps. And was like, and it was just flat. He's saying, well, why wasn't there any fluctuations? And I would agree, I think there should be some fluctuations. So I would kind of be suspicious of the predictive abilities of that simulation. Because it seems like the iodine kind of got locked into different steps and it was such a deep potential energy well that it never popped out again. So the question that I really have to ask myself is that, do I trust those simulations, right? How did they come up with the interaction parameters between iodine and these uh, you know, metal oxide nano cages, right? How well do I trust how they optimized iodine metal oxide interaction parameters, right? Because that's really what that model is dependent on, is how does an iodine molecule interact with that, you know, cage structure? And so using molecular simulations and stat mech, we can break down these really complex problems into more simplified steps. And so I was, I'm skeptical of that <clears throat> accuracy. And especially since the simulation was fairly uninspiring, where it would just monotonically increase until full saturation. It's one of these, uh, one of these situations where I kind of feel like you know exactly what you're going to get out of the simulation. And then you hit enter, and the simulation verifies, and you go, great, don't have to think about it anymore. So I, would, I wouldn't say I was super keen on the actual application but itself, but the intro was very good, covered a lot of heat, nice topics on, on, on stat mech and, and simulations and things like that. Okay, uh, let's get back on track here. So for the canonical partition function, right, this is our NV beta or NVT ensemble. We have entropy is equal to this mathematical expression. This is in terms of temperature, not in terms of beta. Uh, this isn't something that I can just close my eyes and dream exactly of what it means, right? So the canonical partition function isn't necessarily the most natural way for us to relate between the microstate and our macroscopic <laughs> understanding. But we can do that through an equation called the Gibbs entropy equation. And what we will do is show that these two are equivalent. Right, so if we take the summation of all the states times it by the probability and the natural log of that probability, scale it by the Boltzmann factor, and we can come up with the entropy. Right, so the Gibbs entropy equation is a generalized form of the Boltzmann entropy equation. 
in which case we have the Gibbs S equation is this one here. which is the generalized form of the Boltzmann entropy equation. Now, the only reason why I write this up right now uh, Does this look familiar to anyone? Maybe you've seen it in a thermo class or a physical chemistry. This is actually on Boltzmann's uh, headstone. <coughs> so it's a very, very famous equation in the foundations of statmech and atomic theory. It's called the Boltzmann entropy equation. Uh, Gibbs later on, Gibbs as in Gibbs energy fame, uh, later on generalized it to apply it to different ensembles. Uh, so the Boltzmann entropy equation only applies to what we call the microcanonical ensemble, which is what we're going to talk about in just a moment. Uh, but for right now, let's show that this equation and this equation are exactly equivalent so that we can uh, trust that we can manipulate them. So this first term right here is equal to P of I, right? It is the energy of the state scaled by the Boltzmann factor normalized by all the possible states, which is the canonical partition function. If we take the derivative of this expression up here, I had this all worked out last night. That's just not. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, my bad, my bad. We're doing this backwards. Uh, we're going from here to that form. So P of I here is this term here, and ln of P of I is this term here. Sorry, <clears throat> that's what was throwing me off. So we're reworking the Gibbs entropy equation to look like the equation we derived for the canonical partition function. So then when the, we have the natural log of the E, those cancel out, right? Then we have this lingering KBT, which cancels out, goes over here, so this term goes over there. This term right here is just our definition of the internal energy.
So eventually we get out the right answer, or the same, show that this is equivalent. And in this case here, this <coughs> u over t is this term right there, and the kb ln q is, of course, this term over here. Wasn't my smoothest work. But they are equivalent. We can show that. Okay, so now we have assurances that the Gibbs entropy equation is equivalent to what we have seen for the canonical partition function. So S is equal to the minus Boltzmann constant summation over all the states in the system. We have our Gibbs entropy equation. So let's say we only have three possible energy states for our system. Very simplified system. So let's plug it into the equation and see what we get. S is equal to minus KB. Right, we have three, so we have a summation of three different states. <clears throat> uh, we'll say they have the same energy to make the calculations easier. Right, so if they have the same energy, they have the same probability, so we're just adding three different things and they're exactly the same together. That's why we just have the three up front, and we have one-third. Every individual state has a probability of a third because it's the same energy, and times by the natural log of one-third. So then we have our entropy ultimately equals to Boltzmann constant times by the natural log of 3, which is approximately equal to 1.1 kb. So if we say the same thing, but now we have 10 states, The same logic applies, except we're just swapping out 3 for 10, and then we get the entropy is equal to KB natural log of 10, which is approximately equal to 2.3 times the Boltzmann constant. So we can see that in the Gibbs entropy equation, and also in the Boltzmann entropy equation, right, the number of states in the system corresponds very well to the entropy increase the number of states, we increase the entropy. It's not a one-to-one -one increase, it's a logarithmic increase. Now the assumption that we made in this approach here is though to say that we had states of the same energy. This made our math a little bit simpler. Right? So we could say that the probability of being any individual state was exactly the same. <clears throat> now taking states that are in the same energy is what we call the NVE ensemble. I also call it the micro-canonical ensemble. We call this omega n v e. Does anyone want to venture a guess as to why we use omega, the capital omega? Have we used that? nomenclature before so far in StatMech. What does that correspond to? The degeneracy. Are they equivalent? Is the degeneracy of the canonical ensemble just the definition of the micro-canonical ensemble? What do we think? Can someone define degeneracy for me? Same energy level. So how do we feel about using omega for the microcanonical ensemble? Do we feel good about it? They are exactly equivalent. 
right? So in the canonical ensemble, Q, N, V, T, if we say that we're only looking at the states in the canonical ensemble that have the same energy, that gives us our degeneracy of that particular energy level. So the microcanonical ensemble, the name of it makes sense, right? It is a subset of the canonical ensemble, but you have a system with constant energy. So the microcanonical ensemble is just the degeneracy of a particular energy level within the canonical ensemble. So if we define what we mean by microcanonical ensemble, we write it as capital omega, which is our degeneracy for a collection of particles, and the E is being held constant. So if I were to draw out a system that fit well into the <coughs> microcanonical ensemble, we would say volume is constant, which means that delta PV is equal to zero, so we have no pressure volume expansion. There's no way to get energy in and out of the system by shrinking or increasing the box size. Impermeable walls. So that N is equal to a constant. We're not adding or subtracting material in or out of the system. And that it is adiabatic Q is equal to zero. So if we have rigid walls, no heat transfer going in and out of the system, the change in energy is equal to zero or the energy is constant. So according to the equal a priority probability principle, I think is what's called officially, that means every single state in the system is equally probable, right? because the total system energy has to be constant to a value that we specify. So in the microcanonical ensemble, all states are equally probable. <clears throat> so if we were to write out the probability of being in some state i at n, v, e in the microcanonical ensemble, how should we write this? What is, what is it equal to? All states are equally probable. Let's see if we can just come up with this equation right from the, start, uh, from the top of our heads. Let's think about let's think about our probability for the canonical partition function, right? P of i was equal to <clears throat> So what do we call the uh, denominator here. What did we call this in the, in the canonical partition function? That was just Q. So what do we think the probability in the microcanonical ensemble, what equation should we use? So we have some function in the numerator and potentially maybe a partition function in the denominator. But all states are equally probable. Oh. 
is in the denominator. And what do we have in the numerator? How do I make all of these states equally probable? What is that constant? It's actually just one. All the states are completely equally probable, which means that every single state has exactly the same probability. So all we're doing is we're taking all the possible states that the system can be in, and every single one of those is equally likely. So we have one over the total number of possibilities is the probability of being in a particular state for the Gibbs, sorry, for the uh, microcanonical ensemble. <coughs> so let's take this, substitute it into the Gibbs entropy equation, and see what we get. So our probability is one over the microcanonical partition function. <coughs> Excuse me. The Gibbs entropy equation. is given by the summation of pi times probability times the natural log of probability. total number of states that we have in our system that we have to sum over is equal to how many states? <clears throat> how many states do we have to sum over? Which uh, function do we have that tells us exactly how many states we have? So we are summing up an omega's worth of this function. Exactly the same thing that we did when we threw in 3 or 10 as the total number of states in the system. Oh, sorry. This is should be 1 over omega. So we have omega cancels with 1 over omega. Right, the partition functions cancel out. And our entropy, if we take advantage of log properties, we get out the Boltzmann entropy equation. So, in the microcanonical partition function, NVE, the entropy is directly related to the total number of states in the system. In this case, it's just scaled by the natural log. So we can kind of think of the universe as a microcanonical ensemble, right? Energy is being conserved, right? There's no energy change in the universe. If we say that there's no chemical reactions, which is a bit of a stretch, right? The total number of particles in the system is being sustained, and the universe volume, well, there's no really any bounds to it, so let's just say we lock it in time, right? So the microcanonical ensemble basically is a relationship to the universe as a whole, which tells us that the more number of states that the particles can be arranged in, the higher the entropy of the system. <coughs> And so basically, if you want to just throw in numbers, we can make it you know, clear like we did before with the 3 and the 10. So we'll do the same approach for the microcanonical ensemble as what we did for the canonical ensemble. 
we're going to jump back and forth between stat mech and classical to come up with different relationships for other functions. So if we go back to our combined first and second law of thermodynamics, which we know is always valid under all circumstances, we're going to expand S with respect to U, V, and N, which is basically what we did like the first or second week of class. This is equal to the combined first and second law from classical thermo. And we can come up with three different thermodynamic identities, and we'll extend that to three different relationships for our partition function. So in stat mech, typically you don't refer to things as an internal energy, usually it's just referred to as energy. So I just substituted out the E for the U. So in this case here, we can see that microscopically, how the number of states increases as you increase the energy, that is related to the temperature. And classically, we can see that's exactly how we originally defined the temperature in the first place, right? The reciprocal of temperature is ds du. And we have two other relationships. <clears throat> So now we have a way to relate between basically any thermodynamic function we would want to through manipulation of the classical variables through the partition function. So we can see that different ensembles have different pathways to macroscopic thermodynamic functions or behavior and so there are better and easier ensembles to perform calculations in depending on what you want to accomplish. Just like in the seminar speaker's talk, right, if you want to know phase behavior, I think we would use the uh, was it Grand Canonical Ensemble Monte Carlo, I think is the one he spent the most of the time on. And that one where you're inserting and removing particles, that's a different type of simulation as opposed to an NVT simulation or an NVP simulation or an NVE. So ultimately, <clears throat> the easiest type of simulation is probably an NVE simulation, because you don't have to vary the energy of the system at all. You just keep it constant. Uh, but if you wanted to do, let's say, an NVT, where you keep the number of moles constant, the volume constant, but you vary the temperature, you have to have something called a thermostat, which modifies the velocities of the particles to make it so the temperature is constant. If you want to have a constant pressure simulation, you have to vary your box size to make sure that you have a constant pressure going on in the system. And so these are all just basically different strategies and tools to perform different types of calculations. Some of them are more useful for some measurements, others are you know, more optimized for different ones. Ultimately, you know, we can still <coughs> calculate any variable we want to, 
but it just might be a lot more work to calculate it one way versus another way. And so this is a relationship then between the stat, stat mech world and the classical world that we've been working in. But this is sort of where, <clears throat> excuse me, this is where the notion that entropy is equal to randomness comes from, is from the application of stat mech. Without stat mech, we would not have any understanding of how entropy and randomness are ultimately related. And that's all I got for today. So it's been a short, nice short day. Any questions on the content? So when we come back on Monday, it looks like we've got diatomic gases. So basically, you know, what if we have multiple energy modes within a single particle? How do we then predict what is the heat capacity of a more complicated gas molecule? And then we're not going to go too much further on that. We're not going to go to polyatomic gases because it's the same general strategy, just multiply to a lot more complexity. We're going to start talking about interacting particles, which is really where all the interesting behavior comes into things. All right, we'll have a good break, and see you on Monday.